So let me continue now. So David, please. Thanks. So thanks for inviting me to come speak. Um, I, I, I keep telling Mina and I tell people that um, I'm, I'm, uh, I need a reason to come back to Finland. Um, I've been, a, uh, uh, the, the first time I came to, uh, to Finland, actually I've been to Finland before, but um, uh, I, 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 someone, someone asked me once why I came to Finland, was it because of a woman? And it's like, well yes, but not like that. <laughs> So in 2003, after uh, Mina and I had been um, had meetings for a number of years uh, in New York, she moved back. Uh, she, she came back to Finland, and our friend David Hawk came here to teach a class. And so I asked, "Well, haven't seen Mina in a while. Uh, maybe I'll come and visit." And so I came and visit. Um, got involved at uh, Alta University, teaching a little bit, and then became this very strange PhD student. Uh, so you get the experience now of being. Um, the guinea pigs for uh, a dissertation presentation, kind of, um, because I, I've uh, been writing this continuously for uh, actually three years now, um, and this is the first opportunity I've had to present the content all the way to the end. So I'm not going to go through everything, but there are points I think that you'll find interesting about um, open innovation learning, which is what the dissertation is about, and what open data um, means to you. So um, being open, uh, someone asked if the presentation is available. I have a website, coevolving.com. If you go over to the pubs uh, section, you'll find the presentation there. So uh, it's always been available. Um. So uh, David's approach to events has been kind of astonishing. But one of the things is that he's recording. Another thing is that he keeps notes, and the other thing is that the presentations are always open, and they are in on, on his website. So if you want to revisit something, and when we were doing some research projects together, I can still revisit some of the meetings we had in various places. There are kind of description and links to presentations, and everything everything is there. So his kind of a personal style of working has been this kind of a, he makes the notes, I guess, for yourself, but then you are kind of also sharing those openly with the others. And, and it's, it's a bit different way of working than typically we are used to, but that, that's very close to the way this kind of a open source, open yeah. knowledge foundation people are working. So yeah. So, it's so, 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 out there. so, so, so here's a minor thing, since I, I whole presentations have been finished up to this point, so I haven't seen what's going on. I did see one thing. When you publish your presentations, what is the license under which you publish your presentation? You, you don't think about this, right? The, the standard of law in almost all countries is if, as soon as you write something down on paper, so I'll just write down here, it is copywritten. It doesn't matter what it is. I, I could sign Mina's name right here. It's copywritten. No one can copy it without asking my permission. This is the law that happens everywhere that says before you do anything, you have to ask me first. And, and this is really annoying, right? This, this is the problem with being closed. And the publishing world is that way. When you look at um, character sets on a computer, I don't know if you appreciate that the copyright symbol is a character on a keyboard. It is that pervasive. So what is it we really want to have happen? We want people to use our content, and I, I did see the logo for Creative Commons here, and it doesn't necessarily mean that when you are giving content that you have to contact me for all these cases. So what this one says is, when you copy this and you want to distribute it to someone else, there's a so-called buy. So let people know that it came from me, which already my name's on the presentation already, so you don't have to do that. Um, there's a, a no um, NC non-commercial. If you're, if you're okay to produce this, if you're not going to make money off it. Now, if you are a publisher and you're a professional and you're going to make money off this content, you have to contact me. I will give another copyright license to you, which I probably won't charge for. And the third one is share alike. That means that the person that takes this content, so you can download it, you're free to share it in the same way that I shared it with you. What's the alternative? 
Next time you see a, a presentation and it has a copyright symbol on it, you are not permitted to even give it to anyone else. You have to ask the permission of the person before you can give it to anyone else. That's what copyright means. So this is pretty serious and it's standing in the way of, of what I've now called open innovation learning. So the three ideas I'd like to cover with you what does open data mean? Why, what does open meaning mean when I, why does open data mean open sourcing? And I'm going to use the term open sourcing very specifically. And there's some commercial potential around that um, because there's confusion around free and open and what those things mean. Uh, secondly, uh, when did open data begin and what's the history? And I've seen some of that content already come up in some of the slides. But thirdly, the main part that I want to talk about and um, it's important for us to, to think about is how do behaviors change with open innovation learning. So the idea of open innovation has been published in a book called Open Innovation by Henry Chesbro, who's at University of California, Berkeley. It got published in 2003. And the idea behind open innovation essentially is the way that most people had considered research and development to be done is it was done inside a research lab. So one of the case studies that's inside of the Open Innovation Learning book is IBM. So it's great, okay, IBM's a leader in open innovation. And the idea of the old way of working would be that IBM has research labs. It has one of the largest research labs, Bell Labs had them, um, Nokia had labs. And the way that you do development work would be what they call closed innovation, but I prefer to call private innovation because what they would do is they would fund their own research. And you would run into the issue then about, particularly when we start working with universities, well, who owns the copyright on that work? Does a university own the copyright? Does the professor own the copyright? Does a company own the copyright? And you get into all these sorts of issues. Uh, this is pretty unproductive when you're starting off and you have nothing. <laughs> And everyone's working together, and it may become something someday, but all the lawyers have to get involved up front. Well, let's not do that, right? So the idea of open innovation was that idea that you should do, uh, do work outside of your own research lab. So IBM, when they do research, they tend to do research with companies outside of their lab. And IBM got involved in the open source movement early. What open source means, um, and I use the term open sourcing as behavior, open source is a license that says you can see the system internals. So for people who are computer scientists, you know, excuse this explanation, what does source code mean? What happens when you write computer code is you write it in source code, which looks like English, and then it gets translated into machine code, bits and, you know, bits and you can't read the bits. So if someone gives you the computer program, a binary file, you can run it, but then you can't fix it. Open sourcing says, I will give you the original code. So if you have a repair to be made, you can fix it. And the phenomenon now is pretty standard. People are used to the idea of wiki. If you see a spelling mistake on Wikipedia, you can press the button and you can correct it. What's so hard about that? Why should you need a copyright release to tell someone that they've got a spelling mistake in their dictionary entry? That's ridiculous. So the idea of open innovation is closely related at IBM to the open sourcing. But the reason I called it open sourcing is it's not about the licensing. My dissertation covers between 2001 and 2011. For those of you who are old enough to remember IBM when IBM was in real trouble and Lou Gerstner came around and saved the company, um, this is after that period. This is actually the Sam Palmazano period after Lou Gerstner had retired and left IBM. But one of the things that Lou Gerstner discovered when he came to IBM, when IBM was in trouble, was that there were competing labs inside of IBM. And IBM had done this on purpose because um, when you are developing hardware or software, 
you don't want to get hit so that everyone gets wiped out. So you, you've heard about the chip manufacturing factor, factory where they've wiped out one chip manufacturer, there's been some a flood or a fire or a disaster, and all of a sudden there's a world, so, world shortage of chips. And so IBM was in the practice of having multiple teams working on multiple projects, and what would happen would be they would start hiding inside of IBM. They'd say, oh no, you're on a different team. You can't see the work that we're doing. And when Luke Gerstner came in, the first thing he says, wait a minute, aren't you all IBM employees? Who owns this stuff? The corporation owns this. So if the corporation owns this, then why are you hiding it from each other? What does that serve? So open sourcing, when most people think about it, they think about it as open innovation where all of a sudden you're outside the company, but even inside the company. So within Hame, it's all of the data to all the employees that's open. And you know, is there a reason for it to be hidden? Now, the, you know, there's certain things you may not want to show and work in progress and things that are security related, but most of the time it's like, what's the big secret? And, and the more you put secrets on things, the more difficult it is for other people to operate, and then secrets start breeding more secrets, and all of a sudden you have a war. And then you end up like Lou Gerstner, someone that comes in, new CEO, and says, you know, what's this all about? And, and you're, you're competing internally for things that don't matter. So what Lou Gerstner said was, there is no longer any secrets inside of IBM. If there are transfer prices, because we have software being sold to hardware people, we'll work those out. But it does not stop the company from releasing a product. It does not stop us from sharing the product. So there's an idea about open sourcing and commercial. Now the other part that there's, that's related to this is that there's an idea of free software. Free software and open software are slightly different things. What free software is, is uh, that's fundamentally focused on the issue of democracy. And what happens is with free software, when something is free and declared free, that means that one, the source code is always available. So if you bought a word, so if, if you, if you, you, people use Microsoft Office, I've seen it up here, but if you take LibreOffice, LibreOffice or OpenOffice, and you want to go see the code behind it, you can go download it. That's the way it is. That's one of the rules. Now that happens to also be free software in the sense that you can always share it. Um, but the interesting thing about free software, and people don't realize this, you can actually sell free software. It's about the freedom. So if you want to go and download a copy of LibreOffice and go to your next door neighbor and sell it, it's legal to do that. Okay. Free software, it's free, liberty. What does open source mean? Open source means that when you take the code, actually it is freer than that. You don't have to give the source code away anymore. You can take the software and you can do something else with it. So IBM through 2001 to 2011 had this really interesting business. So most of you may not have seen this, but when you go on a web server on the internet, you may hit a page and you'll see the word Apache. The Apache server is the number one web server in the world. It is free software. What did IBM do? It took the free software, it downloaded it, it modified it, and it created what's called the WebSphere brand. So you buy WebSphere application server and IBM charges for it. So now you ask, wait a minute, didn't you just say that you could get it for free, you can go download it? And then you said IBM actually sold the software? You know, are people stupid? Like, why are they doing that? And I'll tell you that most of the profits in the decade between 2001 and 2011 were related to IBM doing exactly that. Oh, you mean so it's free software, you can actually make money off it? It's like, yeah, you can. And the reason is that you end up having now to discuss a value. Why would someone pay IBM for software they get for free? The answer is that community software essentially is all volunteer. And people don't get paid for it. Some people do get paid. Actually, if you work at IBM, what happens is that they take some of the fixes and they contribute it back to the community, 
but that's on whatever schedule they want. If you're an IBM customer and the software breaks, you phone up IBM and say, I want this fixed in 24 hours or I'm throwing you out of the company. And by the way, there's a free alternative that seems to be working just fine. So where there is value, you can charge for it. Where there isn't value, it should be like water, right? So everyone can have water, but we seem to have a large industry in bottled water. Why is that? Okay, so that's a nice preamble. Um, this is my, uh, the structure of my dissertation. Um, open innovation is emerging theory based off open sourcing while private sourcing. So I talked about the open sourcing, which is like IBM participating in the uh, Apache community, and then private sourcing, which is the Webster products they have. I started off with these cases, 2001 to 2011, there are seven cases. Uh, built this new theory. The theory is based, and this is for uh, placing, this is for academic people. Uh, there's some bodies of research already been done that are related to what I'm doing. I didn't use them, but there's the idea of distributed innovation because you have it spread across multiple companies and multiple people. You have open innovation that I told you the book about. You have lead user innovation, so people working at MIT, um, when you start working with users and trying to figure out what it is that they want. Uh, cumulative innovation, which is building on other people's innovations. There's also meta-organizational learning here. Meta-organizational design. So this is not just designing a single organization. It's about designing what you might call a network or an ecosystem of organizations. And that's actually a new field. There's actually a lot of work done in organization design because people think about their own organization. But designing an ecosystem of parties, that's something new. There's all this stuff on community to practice and social learning. And there's this idea of co-responding lifelines. I was mentioning an earlier meeting that I've fallen off Russ Acoff's work and moving towards Gregory Bateson. The reason that I've done that is this idea that the way we should look at systems is like a lifeline over time. The problem with the way that most people look at systems is they think about it like it's at a single point in time. So I am developing a product and there is the product. You go, well, no, actually there are multiple versions of the product changing over time. And not only do you have one product or one service changing over time, you have multiple services changing over time. So here in Hame, you could think about the services you offer, but the services from the state of Finland change. And so if they give fewer services, that doesn't mean that you can't ignore it. You may decide you need to give more services. When I was working um, on a, pro uh, on a, um, a project in, uh, in Canada, um, I was working with the region of Peel, and in Canada, um, eyeglasses are not free. You know, most people go by their, buy their own eyeglasses. Well, in this municipality, they decided that for seniors, they should provide their eyeglasses. And they had the budget, they had their own reason, and that is something that they decided to do. Now, if the government of Canada all of a sudden decides that they're going to give eyeglasses to everyone, obviously the municipality doesn't have to do it anymore. So now you have the idea of corresponding lifelines. You don't ignore them. You have to go back and forth. There's also uh, methods that are associated with this, which are outside the dissertation, that I'm calling service system thinking, that's involved with service science system thinking, and gender and pattern, pattern language, which I may come and teach about some in uh, December. Okay, so sourcing behavior, we're talking about, people say, okay, well, I understand it's open sourcing stuff you told me about. Is it just about software? And I say, no, let's take another example. Let's talk about fishing. Why, I'll talk about salmon, okay? We're gonna talk about a private sourcing example, an open sourcing example, and open sourcing while private sourcing. So aqua farming is private sourcing. So what do they do? You have farm salmon. They control the water, they control the salmon, they control the eggs, they control everything, right? Closed loop. Then we've got the idea of open sourcing, which is going out and just fishing. Go out to the ocean, take the fish. Open sourcing, that's what it is. It's about sourcing. Using the word sourcing is interesting. So what do we have as open sourcing while private sourcing, we have this idea called open ranching. And what they do is that you start off with the fish in and you, you fertilize them, you make sure they're all fine, and then you release them into the ocean. They go out for two to three years and then they come back and they swim upstream and try to spawn. 
and you set up your nets before they get all the way upstream. So why would you do that? Well, now you've got, in effect, semi-wild fish. These are actually wild fish that you've been breeding, but they're wild fish, and they go out, and you didn't have to feed them. Um, they, they're out, and they're in the ocean naturally. So it's like, wait a minute. So all the stuff they did in private sourcing, where you had to feed them and get antibiotics and stuff, you don't have to do that? No, you don't have to do that. So there are ways to do and reasons for doing open sourcing while private sourcing. It's something that you combine the two. This is the actual studies, which you're not going to be so interested in. Uh, these are the seven cases and how they laid out. So the blue line is private sourcing and the green line is open sourcing. And what you'll see at IBM is that um, my favorite one is wikiing. Okay, so what happened? Ward Cunningham invents the wiki in 2003. It's free software, and IBM actually gets in. And IBM, uh, John, John Patrick, who is a vice president at IBM, actually went to a meeting and asked people whether they heard of a wiki. So he's at executive level. No one's heard of a wiki. He comes back into IBM and says, well, this is wiki thing. I don't know whether it's going to take off or not take off, but why don't we try it? And so they tried some software and didn't quite work and they used it with some people, they got feedback and forums, stuff like that. After a while, people started to learn how to use it. And now you have wiki software that's better, you have people who know how to use it, and you have that exchange going on. And after a while, IBM actually sells it as a product. Because if, if you came in 2003, people were going, what is a wiki? I have no idea what a wiki is. It's like, why would you want one? How do you use it? And so trying to sell something that people don't understand is just going uphill, right? So there's all these cases. Now the part uh, that I also have is that it's not just about inside of IBM. There's a context that happens outside of IBM. And this is where I'm going to talk about the history a little bit because there are these contexts in open sourcing. So I started in 2001, but I say that by about 2005, open sourcing happened outside of IBM. So I have out note there. So at large, from 2002, private sourcing business started exploring open sourcing. That's the book that Henry Chesbro book uh, did. From 2002, Creative Commons licensing arose. That's the first time that it did that. So it would uh, we extended the idea of open sourcing from just computer code to written works and to uh, photographs and to rec sound recordings. And so this is one of the interesting things you find as you go along. So um, everyone's heard of Flickr. Uh, now this is one of the interesting things about, about Creative Commons licensing. Flickr has had Creative Commons licensing on their site since 2003. If you want a free photograph, you go down into the part and you read the right license, which is, you know, a person says they want attribution, and you'll see this on my slides. I, the front slide I had was I wanted a, um, a photograph of water running through a stream. I found one. His conditions are by attribution. I have his name on my slides. That's the photographer who took it. I could also go and find ones that people don't even want their name on it. So it's up to you to search on it. But the interesting part is that people don't appreciate this, that you've been able to do that on Flickr since 2003. On Google, on Picasa, you've only been able to do that since 2009. That's how long it took to catch up to these sorts of things. YouTube, when it started off, was not Creative Commons license. You couldn't do that. You couldn't tell people, when I record this conversation, when I have this recording on tape, do whatever you want with it. I couldn't actually do that. It was just, it was all copywritten. So the idea of, of Creative Commons licensing was revolutionary and then people were starting to kind of get used to using it. Now in 2005, Open Government Data with Citizens started, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Around 2005, you also got open source hardware with the maker movement. For those of you who are familiar with Arduino, the Arduino project, what that is is um, getting from software into things that move and blink, so little robots and stuff like that. In Italy, they designed open source hardware. And so anyone can take the plans and they can design it and 
and uh, manufacture it. Um, and then by 2006, the academics are catching up and they're starting to publish stuff. So that's kind of the history of, of what's been happening. I'm going to focus on this 2005 on the open government data. Um, now this is in the dissertation. So open government data, why did this start off in the first place? This actually started off in um, 2002 with an EU directive. Because government records, so, so you're in EU, in the EU parliament, and you're trying to run a multinational initiative, and no one has data. They can't tell you how much the government is spending on health care. They can't tell you how much the government is spent. Like, there's no standardization. So the EU was the one that drove it in the first place and said, we want your national reports in a standard format, and we'd like them in public. Is that so much to ask for if you're a member of the EU? So it took a couple of years for different countries to get up to speed on that. Um, and so uh, we heard about, the, I heard the words Open Knowledge Foundation. That started in the UK. And so the UK was actually the place that started on open data first. But the high idea behind the Open Knowledge Foundation was not just that the EU wanted information, but now the citizens wanted information about their own government. And they had this project, um, uh, number five, it says, they work for you, which is my society. It was a campaign. It's like, where are our tax dollars being spent? We just want to know because we don't know. And so I don't know. In Finland, how's the transparency on your tax dollars? Uh, getting better. Getting better? Getting better. They, are, they, are, they have this kind of a tax tree type of uh, application where you, you see where it's going. Yeah. So, so they yeah. Where it's coming and where it's going. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, so it's, it, it's gradually moving to that direction. Yeah. It means I'm only more interested in what the neighbor is. <laughs> 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 That's true. So um, uh, the Freedom of Information Act, the third one, Freedom of Information Act in 2000 became active in, in 2003. So they passed legislation within the UK about freedom of information within the government, but it turns out that in the UK, Scotland is organized separately from England, and so it wasn't until three years later they could actually get even information across all of the UK. Um, there's various reports, so a wide open report came out, they work for you, power of information report, and then the first open, um, open knowledge conference happened in uh, around 2006. They had then what's called CCAN, the Comprehensive Knowledge Archive Network, which is a standardized format for, uh, for sharing data across jurisdictions. And then you don't get to until halfway through 2008, data.gov.uk. So open data has been a long time in coming, but it takes a while. Now in um, the United States, the Sunlight Foundation was the first one. And why did it start in the United States? The reason it started in the United States was there was a scandal about one of the politicians and where he was spending money, and when that happened, then, then citizens got together and said, that should never have happened because that politician should have reported his spending. And so the Sunlight Foundation was created. For those of you who have heard the expression, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Um, having open data is a, is a good way to keep people honest. Um, there was memorandums of uh, the open government working groups, and then what happened was the White House, when Obama got elected, then he, on his first, one of his first things he did when he came into White House was the memorandum on, tra on, transfer on transparency and open government, which said that, in effect, the government should be open, unless there's a reason for it to be hidden, it should be open. There was a transparency camp after that, um, and, and you start have, having citizens work on it. Now, this is really quite interesting. I had a question about how do you feel about Donald Trump these days? Because if you now go and search on this, there is a, a Obama White House archive. And so Donald Trump has practically erased Obama off the internet the best he could. And uh, the, uh, the staffers that were working there before they got, in, in the period after Trump, Trump got elected, before they got thrown out of the White House, they created that archive because they knew it was going to happen. So if you actually want to go see the original memorandum on transparency and open government, it's not on whitehouse.gov anymore. 
it's it's in another place so we hope it comes back someday but um, if you're looking for transparency in data the United States is not currently a very good place to be looking for it. Um, since I'm Canadian there's also work in uh, Canada uh, and in Canada, there was a lot of work on change camp, so we went down to the municipal level um, and there was change camp in Toronto and Open Toronto and Open Data Catalog Vancouver happened. And so now we're in the 2008-2009 period. So that's kind of the history. Now, is there any interest, I don't know if any of you used Meetup in Finland, actually the meetup.com is available here, but here are two searches. Um, and so uh, across the world, there are 531 meetups labeled with open data. There are 334 meetups labeled with open government. So the, the stuff you're doing is not alone. And there's, there's activity in, in uh, working on that. So the third thing, how do behaviors change with open innovation learning? OK, uh, slight detour here, because now I get into the academic stuff. Um, I told you before that I started off with the data and I worked through. Uh, I have three paradigms. Um, these are descriptive theories. And what I'm trying to do is describe what happened. Okay. Now, um, this turned out to be a great academic exercise. <laughs> but since I'm actually a practical person, it's actually not useful for most people. Most people are interested in what's called normative theory. So normative theory is what do I do with that? And it's okay to have history because, because what, and the way that, I'll find out if I had to rewrite my dissertation this way, but the way I would normally present it for a normal audience is, first if you're going to go open innovation learning, okay, I kind of buy in, what do I do? And what I would do is I say, well, there are these three theories I've built on it. And then in addition to the three theories, if you want to come back afterwards and check your history to find out whether you're doing it or not, or whether you're good or bad, that's when you do the descriptive theories. So we'll come back and check afterwards. So it's kind of like leading indicator, lagging indicator. Okay. So I'm going to focus on this part about the bottom, which is the um, the uh, leading indicators. And so I have three theories. Um, the paradigm here. Uh, I'll tell you briefly what the shift in paradigm is, um, and you'll appreciate this since you're an applied school. Uh, most of the theories that happen around um, around people in sociology is you start getting into constructivism and things that you know we, we see and we have this I we have this interesting turn because of the maker movement uh, which is taught is called material culture so all of a sudden before it used to be when you start studying sociology study people it's like what happened to all the things in the world like what you know there's a physical object we actually build stuff oh, oh no you only see it you don't really behave with it and what's happened in philosophy is there's been the shift towards material culture when you have a maker. And so you have, you have a mobile phone all of a sudden, and the phone interacts with you, and it's like, well, that's not kind of important. So not only am I interacting with you individually as people, but I may be mediated, and I'm talking to you on the phone, or I'm in a video conference, and that changes the philosophy of science in which we look at it. So in doing the normative theory, when we're talking about this sort of stuff, it's kind of like it's nice to be just in the sociology and what the descriptive theories have done, but in the new theories I'm saying technology matters. We spend a lot of time communicating through devices and a lot of the philosophy and a lot of the social theories that work with it don't take that into account. They think that talking to you on the phone is the same to talking to you in person, and obviously we know that's not true. So there's a shift in the philosophy. Um, I'm going to come back into detail, but the theories, there's three theories around this. Innovation, uh, innovation learning for, because when you got into learning, what do you mean by learning? There is learning for, there is learning by, and there is learning alongside. The learning for episteme is a why question. Learning by techni is a how question. And learning alongside is a whom, what, where question. And I'll come back a little bit more about that later. So in my dissertation, what I do is I say, if this is going to be a normative theory, it's going to be useful, how would you use open innovation learning in a practical way? And so I would say, I can't prove anything. This is normative theory. But where the theory is going to be useful is in three cases at least. So one. Uh, anticipating the rise of polycentric governance. So we've had this mo movement over the past 20 years towards globalization. 
I believe that with Donald Trump, Brexit, all these things are happening, we are moving into an anti-globalization movement, and you might use an innovation lens to do that. People have to learn how to not be global again. I think that's coming, and I think this theory could be useful for that. And that, that is really the idea, I would say, it's also that you emphasis on local, but that you also can work together in a global way. Yeah. The, yeah. The, it, it, it's a, when we think about the open data, and, and so we can learn from the other small cities who have applied certain certain things. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, we can do it kind of here, and it can utilize us to predict better to kind of how to do things and, and how to work together. But then, okay, we can connect with others as well. Mm -hmm. so, so it's, this is really, it, it's, it's fundamentally different because of how we can store data, how we can share, how we can kind of keep in contact with Skype calls and things like that. The technology enables all that to happen, but it's... It takes learning to yeah, use it. Yeah, do we really use it? Do we kind of have a contact on the other places and, and can we work together? So, so a simple example of this, historically at IBM, um, we, uh, the, the IBM inside of IBM was a heavy use of email and actually the, uh, well the studies have shown IBMers use email too much. Sometimes it's better to pick up the phone. As opposed to sending five emails back and forth, why just pick up the phone and talk to the person? And then we got into instant messaging. And so we have same, the same time product inside of IBM and you know there are similar products now. You can use WeChat or you can chat on Skype or stuff like that. But people ne need to learn how to use that because inside of IBM you have an instant message that the person could see immediately but the acceptable behavior is the person doesn't respond. It's not acceptable for them to never respond. But what happens is, I, I, was, I remember I was sitting in a meeting in New York City, I live in Toronto, I was sitting in a meeting for New York City and my screen is on, I have this note come up and says, I'm from IBM Korea, can we talk? And it's like, I'm not even going to respond to that because I'm busy in a meeting right now. But he understood, he, firstly he was not frustrated or afraid of sending me a message. I don't know who the guy is, like 300,000 employees inside of IBM and someone sends me a message, like I, I don't know. Um, but um, he wasn't afraid to send me a message, but then if I didn't respond right away, he also understood that I was probably doing something else. That's a behavior that you learn, and it's, it's one that people may or may not be able to cope with. I also work with someone else who, as soon as a message came up, would stop the meeting right there and, and look at his screen. I sure, I sure some of you have seen that happen too, right? No, you, you have to learn that stuff. So a second place where we might learn is on the rise of Internet of Things. There's all the stuff happening about Internet of Things and we don't know exactly what it's going to be. It's an innovation and there's learning associated with it. Do we just assume that, okay, we have Internet of Things, everyone knows how to use it? No, we don't. So there's learning associated with that. And the third one is the idea of cognitive computing or augmented intelligence. All these new AI tools that are coming out. We really don't know how to work with them, so um, I don't know if any of you have um, Alexa from Amazon in your home where you talk to Alexa. Like, it's bad enough you talk to your phone if you have Siri. But do you, you know, do you actually, have you used it all? Do you really know how to use it? How do you, have you used it as a family? These sorts of things, you use it as a group? These things are going to require learning. So there are cases where these things could be applied. So for the last slide, let me expand these out a little bit and talk about what these three types of learning would be. So Innovation Learning 4, there's three categories, proto-learning, deutero-learning, and trito-learning. Let me explain those because they actually come from Gregory Bateson in systems theory. So Gregory Bateson um, wanted to understand learning and the way he was doing that, he, he, he got a grant and was in Hawaii and he went to study porpoises. And so the question is, how do you teach a dolph how do you teach a, a, a porpoise to respond to whatever tricks you want to do. So, a, like, like a dolphin or Yeah, a dolphin. Okay. Well, yeah. I used to call them dolphins. Correctly, I should, I'm trying to correct myself. I used to say dolphins, but porpoises is correct. So he okay, was but like... We, well, we might not, not know the word. Yes, I know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so you have, firstly, no learning, which is 
You try to get the porpoise to do a trick, it ignores you. Okay? Then you have what's called learning one. So the dolphin comes out, does a somersault, give it a fish. Dolphin comes out, you give it a somersault, give it a fish. That's called learning one or proto learning. Okay, so then what Gregory Bateson did was he tried to figure out, well, okay, so um, what happens if we want them to respond not with the same trick every time, but have a different trick? So the porpoise comes out, does a trick, does a somersault, give it a fish. The dolphin comes out, does a somersault, no reward. Okay, dolphin's puzzled now. Wait a minute, I did the trick, give me my treat. And does it again, no reward. Dolphin gets frustrated and just, just jumps out of the water. Give it a treat. Now I'm confused. Does that same jump again? No reward. It turns out that the porpoises are smart enough to figure out they are being rewarded for doing a new behavior, not for doing the same behavior over and over again. So that is what's called deuteral learning. It's the second level learning, learning two. So they would do different kind of tricks to get the rewards. Yes. And, and of course, you know, in school we have this, are you being rewarded for what you know, or are you being rewarded for what you learn? And really, you want to be rewarded for learning, not for knowing the same thing over and over. Otherwise, what's the point of going to school for 12 years and then going to university? Like, everything you knew you should have known in kindergarten, right? That's the third idea. So then there's this third idea, which is, and, and this is systems. Um, can you move the dolphin or the porpoise out to a different environment? So you've had them doing this inside a pool. If you take them out to the ocean, will they survive? Will they be able to do the tricks in the ocean? And this is called trito learning. And uh, my friend David Hawk and I have been puzzling over this for a number of years. Can you actually teach people to do that? And I have David come in now, and I have to tell you about um, my personal experience. So I have four sons. And I'm Chinese, ethnically. Uh, my father moved to Canada when he was 16 years old. We moved to a town 100 miles north of Toronto that looks exactly like this. We have the same granite rock. We have the same pine trees. It looks exactly like this at, at home for me. And in a small town, my, my parents got called in when my sister and I were very young and, and starting off in school. And we were told, your kids are not learning English fast enough. We want you to speak English at home. So my father always spoke English to us, which is why my English is great. But my heritage Chinese is awful. I can speak to my grandmother, you know, that's about the level of it, and then no one else understands me. But there's a million dialects in China anyway, so it's not really a, a big deal. And so I moved to Toronto, where there's a community, it was made, made a very large community, and I decided to fix this. So um, uh, my eldest son, Adam, um, he was grade 11 and uh, you know, going to graduate soon, so I played badminton with him once a week for like a year and a half, and started off with um, Adam. Um, okay, the natural path is you graduate high school and you would go to university in Canada. Um, how about if uh, you, you graduate from high school and you go to China for two years and study Mandarin? And so, you know, the idea is that you learn about Chinese culture and you have two years to learn Mandarin. And, I'm not, and even the grades don't matter because, you know, all you need is grade 12 in Ontario, and then you can go to university, and the fact you went to university for two years is really irrelevant, right? So, so you're qualified to go to university. And so it's first like, well, why would I do that? And then after playing badminton for a couple of years, it's like, oh, why not? So my eldest son, Adam, who we don't speak Chinese at home, went, got on a plane, landed in Beijing, I told him he had to learn a couple of things. One of them was, you need to have enough instruction so you can get in a taxi that they will take you to the university. When you get to the university, the wonderful thing about universities, every September they have these foreign students come in that don't speak the language. They know how to handle foreign students, so I'm not worried about that. As long as you get to the university, you're fine. And then um, I said, you have two other things to do. One, you get a mobile phone and you phone us so that we can get in touch with you. Two, you open a bank account. So he goes out the first day. He goes and finds a friend. They go, they buy a phone, doesn't take long, puts in the SIM card, things work, phone home, that's great. Then he goes to the bank. Now, the, he goes to the bank. Now, he's Canadian. The Canadian banking system is one of the best banking systems in the world. 
You go in, you open an account, out in an hour. You go to a Chinese bank, four hours later, and the bank account is still not open. You go, what the hell? And I said, this is why you're in China. Because you are now in a different environment, and you can't expect to learn. You can't expect, no, I, could tell, I could have told you before, the opening a Chinese bank account is not like opening a Canadian bank account. But you wouldn't have believed me. And now you experience it. So we've got the idea the dolphin is now in the ocean, right? And then I had the experience <laughs> four times. So I have four sons. All of them do this, right? So you them to Chinese ocean. Yep. And so then, um, uh, because uh, Mean and I have been to Japan quite often uh, on the invitation of Tokyo Institute of Technology, and so I take my sons to Japan, and so their first expectation is, well, Tokyo is like Beijing, and they get them, they go, oh, it's not like Beijing, but it doesn't take them any time to adjust. As a matter of fact, the characters are Chinese characters, or Jap Japanese is based off Chinese characters. It's not the same, but they're used to reading Chinese characters all the time. They go, oh, this is nothing. And so um, many years later, I took my fourth son. Um, he missed some vacation with us. He and I went to Paris at Christmas time, and he gets to Paris and goes, "What's the big deal about going to Paris? Like French signs? We live in Canada. We have French signs in Canada. We speak French in Canada. What's the big deal about going to Ch Paris? It's like you know, it's like going to Montreal." And so these guys are able to do trito learning. You can take them out of an environment. Put them in a different environment. I'm, I always get entertained when, when um, I visit Mina and I see her son Tommy. Uh, there was this one, one t uh, story I heard which was all these kids are playing out together and, uh, and someone said, um, where are the kids? I said, oh yeah, there's all these Finnish kids playing out there and there's one American because he speaks flawless English. And so it's always entertaining I go because Tommy speaks flawless English. He was in New Jersey for two years? Two years. Two years and for him it's like he thinks he's from New Jersey. He speaks that way. And so he is also a trito learner. He has been to the United States. He realizes Finland's different. And that's, that's, what, that, that's the challenge. So what this says when you're talking about innovation learning for, what are you learning for? Are you learning to do the same thing over and over again? Are you learning to have a broader range of alternatives? So different tricks, same pool. Or are you actually trying to get into different environments? So if you're starting to talk about stuff like um, fifth generation, you know, uh, 5G stuff, that's a different ocean. Yeah. You're in a different ocean. The, the behaviors that you're going to learn are so far different, and you can't penalize people for going into a different ocean and failing. They have to learn to swim in that ocean. That, that's, that's a tricky thing related to open, open data because the business models are changing and the logic is changing and the behaviors are changing. Even the laws are changing. Uh, so, so it's kind of a whole system is in a move. Mm. And, and, and it, it's, a, it's a really challenging situation. The way we operate, operate things and, it, and it's well, interesting times. So it's continuously the case. Yeah, well, you see, now, now what happens, and, and this is the thing when people say, oh, everyone should be learning to be trito learning. I say, no, you do not want the whole world to be trito learning. When you want your garbage picked up, you want it picked up the same way every week consistently, like you want it handled, you want your water to come on, you don't want all these different things happening. So there are different types of learning and there are different roles that people will take and in different situations you need different behaviors. But you need to recognize there are different types. But that is kind of quite challenging in that, that respect when we talk about the kind of the opening up the data and utilizing the open data and, and so it, it's really a rather big paradigm shift yeah. in, in your thinking. And the thing is that uh, if the managers or the executives are not necessarily kind of, they might talk it, they might use the words a lot. Open-minded. Yeah, but, but then do, do they really understand how many things will change? Let, let me go through the other two and then we'll have a, a more uh, detailed discussion. So the second one 
innovation learning by. And when I talk about um, learning by, this is not just an individual, but a group of people. There are three development situations. You've heard of learning by doing. Um, when you actually get into the literature about learning by doing, learning by doing actually was associated with um, aircraft manufacturing and they have this learning curve that you go down. And what it says is that the more you build aircraft, the better you get. The quality goes, because you know, if you're building your 100th aircraft, it's better than building your first aircraft. So you learn by doing, by building the aircraft. There's a second one, which is learning by making. Um, and this is actually pretty interesting because um, we don't think about it, unless, unless you are a crafter. If you're knitting, right? Yeah. yeah. You learn by making. And so you have this permission, which is you have to be, have your hands on, you have to feel it. It's not like aircraft manufacturing that is um, engineered and standardized. like. Um, baking bread. Like I understand, I don't bake bread, but I understand people can feel the humidity and go, I need more yeast, less yeast, more water, less water, I'm not sure what it is. But people actually learn by making. And this again is starting to get out of the abstract into the material culture, is there's knowledge and there's something you're working on. There's a third type here, which is interesting, called learning by trying. Uh, and learning by trying means that it's acceptable to fail. In particular, I have this open source software. So I work in this world, like oh, I, I'm totally immersed in it. My laptop, uh, my laptop is Linux, and now it's like going to be three types of Linux. But what happens when the software is free, how do you know what to do with it? How do you know if it's going to work or not work? The best thing I've said is do learning by trying. Download it, spend an hour working on it, like put a clock on, if I download a piece of software and after one hour I can't get it working, I'm not going to use it. <laughs> like really, it's going to be a waste of time. I, I could, but there's no way of knowing. It's not a learning by making thing. Like I've never used the software before. So there's a learning by trying associated with that. And when you go into a learning by trying mode, you have to allow for failure. You have to accept that failure is an option. So, so this is about the beta culture, yeah. kind of. And, mm -hmm. and it's about the demos and it's about the kokeilu kulttuuri, this kind of uh, uh, experimenting, which is now very much emphasized in several uh, di different types of things. But you, you often hear executives saying failure is not an option. This says learning by trying, failure has to be an option. Now, not in all circumstances. Learning by doing is different. Learning by doing says you're building aircraft, you're going to send a man to the moon, whatever. That is a no-fail situation, and we're going to make sure. But there's not the, most of the world is not like that. Most of the world is, let's say we're going to have the opportunity, we're going to try, and we're going to fail. And it's okay to fail. And the idea is that all of us are okay, but then in a certain circumstances, if you are doing a heart surgery, you are not doing this learning by trying. <laughs> yes. Same thing, hopefully. But then if you are then... If you have a terminal illness and you're going to die anyway, some people say, I'd rather take the gamble and die on the table because I might live. 1% chance, I'm willing to take it because I'm going to die anyway. Okay. Okay? The last one, lear learning, innovation learning alongside. Now, now we're getting into people learning together or multiple communities working in parallel. And what happens is that we have this entanglement that happens. Um, the first one, these are a bit complicated, polyrhythmia entangling eurythmia. Now one of the things I've been developing in this is systems theory is not very well developed in rhythm. And when you look at the philosophy, there's a conference that they've been doing recently. Actually philosophers understand harmony pretty well, but philosophers have actually not studied much on rhythm. It's actually a new field, but you hadn't thought about it. And so this idea of eurythmia, your heart beats. And when you dance and you have music, it kind of naturally falls into line. But there's also the idea of polyrhythmia, where you have multiple rhythms and somehow they mesh together. So I still have to convince my dissertation advisor because she asked, would you remove this from your dissertation? I said, no, I'm not going to remove it. For those of you who know the rock band, the police. No, no, to draw, because <laughs> <laughs> then I really start to Okay, so, yeah, yeah. so the police, 
play reggae and punk music at the same time. They are polyrhythmic. They are not eurythmic. The, the beats don't naturally come together. So if any of you are musicians, like, and you've actually, if you're a musician like me, I'm a bass player, and you ever go to try to play The Police, it is the most difficult music around the play. It's more difficult than most jazz because you have the guitar ahead of the beat, you have the drum on the beat, and you have the bass behind the beat. And it's really, really difficult. So you have this balance now because if the police was the only music around, it'd be one thing, but a lot of the world likes rhythmic stuff. Um, I don't like canto pop, the Chinese music they play. It's all swing songy, you know, they like nice tunes. Very, very rhythmic. I like a little more edge to it. And so there's always this tension whether you want something that's eurythmic, which is, you know, well synchronized versus something that is polyrhythmic. And, and you can tell from the learning above, the other types of learning is saying you can't just do one kind of learning. You have to do multiple. And, you ha and you're going to have the struggle constantly between the two, and there's no right there. Sometimes it's eurythmic, sometimes it's polyrhythmic. The second one is regenerating, entangling, preserving. This is particularly relevant in the sustainability literature. Uh, one of the things that's cited is uh, there's a, um, an, a chapter called The Second Life of Trees. In Japan, the way they think about trees is there's a first life and a second life. So the life of a tree is 60 years. For 30 years, you look after the tree. For the next 30 years, the tree looks after you. You cut down the tree after 30 years, and it becomes a, the lumber for your house. So there's this tension because a lot of people who are thinking of sustainability think a tree should never be cut down. It should be all old growth forest. But that's not what the Japanese culture says. The Japanese culture says a tree is a plant that grows for, it's a living thing, it grows for a very long time. If you let it get too old, it's dead on its feet. It's not really alive anymore. So what they say is that you should actually have the idea of regeneration. After 60 years, you clear the trees, you grow new trees. So there's this tension between the regenerating of trees and the preserving, which is keeping the trees the older and older. The third one, and this gets into systems theory, and this is from um, Ian Mitroff, um, more, less leading to more and more leading to more are two tensions that happen. And this happens particularly when you start working, and his original research was on nuclear proliferation. So the US has more missiles, and Russia has more missiles, and yet everyone gets more missiles, it doesn't help. So more leads to more, this is not the direction you want to go. If you could actually get it to a case where both are reducing, less leads to more. And there's system theory, we could take it another time, we will discuss this afterwards, that when you're doing hierarchy theory in systems, what you are doing is you are creating less equals more. And the question is, can you get there? So just to s summarize again, <laughs> these are tensions that happen. And now you see there's multiple types of learning that happen, and they all happen at the same time. So open data. What's happening here with open data? We have some people are in proto-learning mode, some people are in doodle learning, some people are in trito learning. You have people who are learning by doing, you have people who are learning by making, some people are learning by trying, and all along you've got people who are in tension with each other in trying to do their learning because some people know and some people don't, and you're trying to balance across that. And that is the end of my presentation. Yeah, just take a quick but okay. previ previous one there, just kind of understanding the idea of the re different rhythms. So, so the idea of there kind of generating new new kinds of things. Do we work in an agile mode with a mm -hmm. two week cycle, the demo and development, demo and development, demo and development, and so on? So, are we capable of moving? In, in that way, or do we move in a quarterly cycle or in the projects typically the steering group meetings are kind of once in a six month and you don't actually get feedback on what you are doing, you are just somehow doing the negotiations there. And, and so this, uh, how, how do you operate in the different rhythms within the project for example in this open data thing? So do we take this kind of a 
more agile type of a way of going forward with the short demos and how do we combine that with the steering group uh, project meetings or steering group meetings in a way that the whole project timeline is done well. Yeah, or change of legislation can take years and mm -hmm. you can wait it and make your own written based on yeah. that. You know. but, but so these kind of different rhythms will be within the project we are taking forward. Okay, so that's the kind of a middle part. <laughs> right. Pa pa part, no, no, it's this polyrhythmia. And so on, and this learning by doing, learning, learning by trying. So kind of these demos that we could do in between and try it out how it would work with some of the cases would be more, more of this learning by trying. Typically the development projects, the idea is there, but from the beginning you know exactly what you are doing and then you have to kind of, the steering group you have to present all of the time that yes, this was our plan, we are exactly going our plan and, and so on. But hopefully with this and the idea re related to open data project needs to be more flexible in that respect. And luckily you wrote your proposal that there is room for development and room for changing and so on. And luckily our our experts kind of appreciated that as well. So 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 we have that learning by trying within within this project. And then thinking about really this um, uh, taking several things, so the technology is kind of going ahead, uh, our behaviors are there, and then the, the kind of this, our regional governance is changing, and then the 5G is coming, the technologies are changing. They are not going in this sequence, they are going a little bit different way, but, but we are kind of more or less jumping into that 5 uh, the unknown sea with really or we are preparing to jump into more unknown sea with this open data C kind of a stuff yeah okay. yeah okay. cool <laughs> <laughs> okay. <No. Ooh. laughs> but maybe we can save it for Thanks. Yeah. yeah. A little bit of a challenge for us. Yeah. But it's nice that we have now had very concrete demos and examples what have been done and we have theoretical background for everything and makes us think more and it's combined those and we find a great way for it. <laughs>